Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, hello and welcome back to the channel, everybody. In today's video, we find ourselves out in Nevada with Roger Hillegas, the sovereign citizen who kidnapped his own mother from a nursing home because of reasons. So basically, there was a dispute in custody and... Uh, well, he was not apparently barred from the nursing home that she is residing at. He uh, went and got her, kidnapped her, and, uh, well, uh, he didn't really have a place for her to go anyway. Well, long story short is that uh, he was caught and he was charged with the crime. And he ended up... Uh, well, spewing out a bunch of sovereign citizen nonsense, which led to a competency hearing where he, uh, well, was declared competent, but he fired his attorneys. He uh, decided to represent himself pro se. Well, he said he was not going to represent himself. He was going to, how did he put it? Oh, yeah, that's right. He was going to present himself. So the judge ended up agreeing to that and uh, requested that uh, Mr. Hillegas get everything that he needed to defend himself, which he already had access to via his uh, attorney, but given that he fired him, so as a result, he really had no idea that his attorney had already done the discovery portion of uh, the proceedings. So really... I mean, the guy needs help. But all that was a couple weeks ago, so now we are back, to de and the judge is here to determine whether or not his needs have been met for trial. But, of course, he ha has a whole lot of complaining to do, and none of it really relevant to the trial. It's, well, not all of it relevant to the trial itself. So let's go ahead and sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Um, or recognizes Mr. State E representing the state and Mr. Hillegas self-represented. Mr. Hillegas, I see that you are, because you're in custody, and I think we talked last time you were here about having your hands free. Um, if you um, promise to comply with court orders with respect to your being unshackled, the, the court will order the deputy to free your arms. You don't anticipate any issues with that, Mr. Hillegas, do you? No. Okay, the deputy, if you please uh, release both of Mr. Hillegas's hands. Judge Mr. Hillary is asking him to remove the waist restraints all together or do you want his hands out? Well, is, can you move your hands uh, freely? Yeah, I that's can, but I've got this chain wrapped around my waist that makes it hard to stand up. Well, let's see if, if we need to have you stand at any time when you're addressing the court, then we'll, we'll make a decision. But right now, I think we're good. Can this I remain is, seated? Say that again. Can I remain seated? Yeah, you make it, can remain seated. <clears throat> Just a minute here. All right. This is the hearing that the court set to follow up on our recent hearing with respect to many issues. Uh, importantly though, Mr. Hillegas' access to um, the discovery, uh, electronic data, filing, computers, paper copies, things like that. The court, after that hearing on or about June 16, <laughs> filed an order regarding defendant Hillegas' electronic and discovery access while in custody. The court did that after a level of collaboration with the court's filing office, Washington County Sheriff's Office, court administration, tried as best it could to fashion an approach that would account for 
Mr. Hillegas is in custody, self-represented status, take into account the nature and severity of the charges against him, the upcoming trial date, um, recognition that, you know, we have rules that apply to, to people and they, they need to be applied and we're not markedly or materially changing them on, for one person and then encouraging that to be the new normal for, for everyone. So the order went out and there were two objections filed to that order. One was by the uh, Washington County Public Defender's <coughs> Office who is graciously present here today through um, the, the new um, Washington County Public Defender, Mr. Grosnick, objecting uh, to that portion of the order that sought the <coughs> Washington County Public Defender to provide a laptop and other accessories, um, noting, and I'll hear from Ms. Grosnick in a moment if she'd like to address the court, but essentially noting that really not part of their job responsibility, also resource responsibility, things like that. Uh, the second uh, objection was by the uh, Watch County Public, uh, Watch County District Attorney's Office through Mr. Stegey, specifically to that portion of the order that required paper copies of the discovery and filings that have occurred in, in the future, indicating that an electronic essentially should be sufficient. <clears throat> That's just paraphrasing. Now, uh, this may sound unusual, but this is coming from a soft tard, so bear with me. When the discovery portion of the trial was mentioned in the previous uh, hearing, he didn't want any electronic versions of it. He wanted all hard copies, in other words, everything in paper format including videos, which basically means somebody's got to transcribe every single word of those videos and anything else onto paper. Now, later on, we find out that this is going to be well over 5,000 sheets of paper used for this idiot. I mean, 5,000 pieces of paper, uh, dude, I think you'd be swimming in paper and you would definitely need a lot of help. You shouldn't have fired your attorney because they at least have a firm to help them out. Uh, the court met briefly this morning with the Watts County Sheriff's Office, court uh, filing staff, court administration again to take another look at it. And was considering that, unlike in the United States District Court, where I understand for a self-represented litigant, it would be the United States Public Defender's Office, Federal Public Defender, to provide a laptop. The court may have gotten over its skis a little bit and directed the Washington County Public Defender to do something which they ordinarily wouldn't be doing. So the question is, who then gets the laptop to Mr. Hilgis and uh, what type of access will he have for reviewing, filing, and um, research? And then the question from the, the other question is from the state, is it simply a matter of resisting making paper copies or is it something more than that? Let me start there first. Mr. Stegey, what, what's the concern, please? And how would you propose the court to address the concerns that were raised at the last hearing? And, uh, codified in the court order. So, as I pointed out in my objection, rules favor um, electronic service. This is a district where e-filing is mandatory. The court can make findings for non-people uh, who don't have internet access and allow them to file things um, the old-fashioned way, uh, if you will. As to the discovery um, issue, now I certainly appreciate that the court is trying to make uh, this situation work. Um, well, I would say I'm trying to find a balance, right? A balance right. taking into account that we have trial in two months, right? That Mr. Early is charged with several serious crimes, that I want to make sure he has a a access. <laughs> to the discovery, to filings, to court orders, um, taking into account uh, legitimate security concerns raised by the Washington County Sheriff's Office. And um, 
move this case forward. So those are the that's the background. Right, and so uh, this the law has very little to say about the manner in which the prosecution turns over discovery, right, or the defense turns over discovery. It is largely run by the parties unless there is an issue which uh, the law allows them to bring uh, before the court. So the court's preference for paper, um, it doesn't make sense when a large part of this case involved digital media, right? If there's going to be things like body-worn cameras, recorded interviews, which are in digital format, it does not make sense to then have 5,000 pages of paper in addition um, to that. It's also... Well, let me stop you there. You know, paper can be in a box or boxes right. in Mr. Hilgis's cell, and he can wake up at 2 in the morning if he's thinking about his case or can't sleep. He can go through it. He can take a, a pen and make notes on it. Whereas yep. digital access, you know, is more, more limited, more circumscribed. Right, but I would say the law doesn't care. The well, law but, says, but the court cares when we have okay. a trial in two months. Right, and he's he's behind the curve because we had an issue on competency until fairly recently. And this is exactly why you need an attorney to begin with to help you out with this mountain of paperwork. I mean, you can't. Do it alone. There's a lot of lawyers out there who are too busy with multiple cases who can't do this alone either. That's why there are teams of people a lot of the time, I'm not saying every time, doing all the necessary paperwork and everything like that. Well, I would say he's not behind the curtain. I would reflect back on this, Your Honor. During, up until the time where he fled the jurisdiction, You'll find in the court's file that we gave notice that discovery was available for pickup at our office. I think he did not. He never uh, took advantage of it. But it's always helpful, I think, to come back to the law. And the law, uh, the court almost never gets involved in having a preference for how discovery is turned over or, or, or managed for that matter. So the court's belief that paper is easier, um, in fact, is more burdensome. Right, and and the law, the Supreme Court law says you're not going to special <coughs> privileges. Yes, the court can envision him wanting to get up in the middle of the night to have paper in his file, but that sounds to me exactly like a special privilege. When he's in custody, right? Yes. If he were home, and he woke up at two in the morning, and he had access to his computer, he could review the discovery produced by the state. But he's not. He's re, he's restricted. Again, I come back to he's not the first self represented person in this district or anywhere to represent himself. He had much higher profile, much more serious. To represent cases. himself two months before trial. Right. To represent himself two months before trial, where he's facing multiple serious felonies. Right. And, and so, so slow down his ability to properly defend himself because he has restricted access to information that he may need to properly prepare. Okay. Yeah. And the court is presuming that paper is easier for him and that there will be put another way the man has nothing to do right and so whether it's at two o'clock in the morning or during the regular course of the day the format i would say the law has almost nothing to say about now if you want i'll give you five thousand but so i would sort of urge caution there right that if the court were looking for a hook in terms of the manner in which discovery is handled I think it might take a little bit of searching to find one, but should the court find one in order, paper plus digital? Well, I've already ordered it. Okay. So right now you're asking the court to reconsider. Yes, yes. right. Well, and I'm also, I will say, a bit concerned that, um, you know, no input from the prosecution office is used to handling thousands of discovery cases a year. Um, zero consultation. Uh, from the sheriff's office on this subject in terms of ease, right? In terms of best practices <coughs> in this situation. In any event, we'll turn over the paper, but we still have this issue of the digital media. Well, we're going to get to that, right? Okay. We'll get to that too. And, and you know, on that subject, the public defender's objection is well taken. We're not a party to this case. 
um, you know, this sort of idea of parties of convenience. I think the order contemplates, well, the PD is a party of convenience, make them do it in the same way. Well, paper is more convenient, let's do it in paper. Actually, I, I you, you, let me, let me sorry to, to, to talk over you, but you just, you just uh, spurred a question in the court's mind. Who, who makes sure that he had, Mr. Hilligan has proper clothing to wear to court on trial days? If the Washington County Public Defender is not involved. Well, they're not, they're not appointed. I, I presume it's the jail, right? I say o overall, <laughs> what the Constitution requires the defendant have reasonable access to prepare for trial. Right, that does not mean special privileges. I, in fact, I don't even know that 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 would go so far as to say have anything to say about jail clothes. But again, here we are solving a problem for a self-represented litig litigant who does not get extra help to be a self <coughs> consideration. Should he have a motion for clothing, I'm sure the court can, uh, can come up with a good a resolution to it. So I would always come back to what does the law say about it? The law says that is, the Constitution requires that the, the jail provide them reasonable access to prepare for trial. Let me summarize what I understand your position is. Uh, Judge, there's a lot of digital media, digital discovery, videos, audio. That's We, we have to make sure there's a a remedy here that allows Mr. Elias access to that. If you force us to print out every piece of paper, in this case, a discovery piece of paper, uh, going forward and get it over to him, we'll do it, but we'll do it holding our nose. We don't think we should have to. We don't think it accomplishes anything. And we don't think that reasonable access requires that. I summarize your argument? Yes, and I would say digital is easier than paper. I understand your position. So, Mr. Hilligus, talking about uh, at the last hearing, you said, Judge, I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't have any of this, and I, I would like paper copies. What, have you thought about that, and what, what's your position on, the, on all that, please? Thank you for allowing me to be seated to address the court, but I would like to address the court, and I'd like to have my right to be heard, and I'd like to have my right to, to defend myself. I come in peace. I will remain in honor. I call for a transcript of this hearing, and I'd like to be sworn in. Well, I'm not swearing you right now because I'm... I'd like what I, what I say to be sworn testimony is to be true, and that's what's coming next. Dude, this is just a hearing to determine whether or not your needs have been met in jail to uh, help you represent yourself in court. This is not the actual trial itself. There is no swearing in or anything like that. Uh, this is exactly why idiots like you need all the help they can get when you don't even know the basic procedures. I do not consent to contract with your for-profit corporation. It has a Dun & Bradstreet number, and I object to this hearing as you lack jurisdiction. I'm appearing by special appearance. I challenge your jurisdiction, and I... Um, and it's not been proven through the record. And I'd like to cite some of the cases that I've cited. Well, let me stop you right there. Bailey versus Sherrod. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay there, uh, dude. Uh, you've made a claim that the United States justice system is pretty much a for-profit corporation. What is your evidence for such a claim? And please present the facts only, not conjecture. Otherwise, it's just irrelevant to this hearing as a whole. Now, secondly, you claim that they have no jurisdiction over you. Well, you live in Nevada, so they do have jurisdiction over you. And if you actually believed that they didn't have jurisdiction over you anyway, why are you even here? Why didn't you just walk out of prison or jail or whatever and present that argument in a way that the that they would let you out of there. Oh wait, that doesn't exactly work because Nevada does have jurisdiction over your dumb ass. Now, thirdly, I am not even gonna bother looking up those cases that I've already looked up countless times before that have no relevance to what you're talking about anyway. You just like to cherry pick and uh, hope it sticks to the wall when you toss it up there like spaghetti. 
I'm not here right now to discuss with you your philosophy on or your approach to or your belief in the court's jurisdiction. We're here to talk about access to discovery, access to computer, access to paper filings, <clears throat> making sure you have time to prepare, um, things like that. Now, I, I realize you have other things on the agenda, but right now, the court's not here to, to go over that. I appreciate your denial of jurisdiction, but jurisdiction is everything. Without jurisdiction, you have no authority to make any decisions in this case. We don't have to explain to the court what the law is. I've what I cited want to case law from the United States Supreme Court, SCOTUS, that challenges your jurisdiction. I've cited 50 cases that challenge your jurisdiction, <coughs> and you have not responded. So without jurisdiction, you have no... You have no ability to make any orders in this court. Your orders are null and void and unenforceable. Okay, a little bit of an explanation here. Uh, apparently, this softard believes that since he gave the judge a paper with all this research on it and that he didn't respond to it, that he essentially agrees with the softard that the judge has no jurisdiction. I know it sounds nuts, but that's what it boils down to here, and that's what you'll see throughout the rest of this. He handed the judge or gave the judge a paper saying this, and because of his silence, the silence meant that the judge agreed with them. That doesn't exactly work in real life. I mean, imagine this. If you walk into a bank and present the teller with the clerk saying that I have... $25 million in the bank and the clerk doesn't miss say a word on that, that magically uh, means that you have $25 million in the bank. I mean, life doesn't work like that. But essentially, that's what this Savtard believes. And this is how it's going to work throughout the rest of this hearing when the judge doesn't answer Anything that the soft heart has to say. And you're a trespasser on the law. Because you are you are proven you are Lewis. moving forward in Mr. a Lewis. case <coughs> jurisdiction. So let's I want to talk about your order right here. All right, hold on. Let's do this though. You, because the last several times I've seen you, you've indicated that you object to the court's jurisdiction. You believe the court lacks jurisdiction. You can have an ongoing objection. You do not need to recite it or repeat it every time. Your your objection is preserved for the record. I agree with you that my objection is preserved for the record. I'd just like to cite some of the case law that I've cited explaining why I believe that you lack jurisdiction. Well, we've, we've, we've gone over that before. Now we're no, we have not. I have not cited Bailey versus Sharada, State versus Huller, Huff versus Shepard, Mahoney versus Boise Title and Trust, Menlo <coughs> versus U.S., Higgins versus Levine, Stenard versus Olson. Maine versus Tillabot, Struck versus Medical Examiners, Roseman versus Lambert, Lantana versus Hopper. The town of Lanta, Florida versus Hopper, stating that the burden of jurisdiction rests on him who invokes it. So basically stating claims require evidence. And since you had the argument, you're the one who made the claim that uh, they have no jurisdiction. And the default position in this case is that the court does have jurisdiction over you. That, that basically means that, uh, well, you have the burden of proof when it comes to the jurisdiction argument. So you made the claim, so therefore you have to present the facts in a clear, concise manner instead of saying that you have no jurisdiction and presenting cases that really only say that you have to have the burden of proof uh, in this case. I mean, come on now. Well, guys, I'm going to call it on this uh, part of the... Uh, hearing the hearing is over an hour long so there's plenty more to come of his stupidity that I can easily destroy so I will see you guys on the next one take care